On the next episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored, we are going to be speaking to... Go ahead. It's a certified... Registered. Robin Goldberg, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified eating disorder registered dietitian. See, that is a lot of stuff. That's for why me you pointed to. Yeah, I did because she she's got this. Robin Goldberg has got this with Dr. Roddy Raban, your uh, board certified plastic surgeon, right here in Beverly Hills, and his co-host Monique, with no letters or anything at the end of my name at all. But please listen, plastic surgery uncensored. On today's episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored with board-certified plastic surgeon, Dr. Roddy Roban, we have a board, no, you're not a, you're a registered dietitian. See, I got we confused. Are, I board certified. We have yeah, to, yeah. Yes. Robin Goldberg, and uh, I'm Monique Marvez, and we're going to discuss all things nutrition, because that's important. Yeah, so Robin and I are good friends, and I appreciate you coming. Um, it's good. It's, it's nice to have... We, what we like to try to do on the show constantly is try to bring different aspects. Obviously, the show is about plastic surgery, but plastic surgery is about much more than just your breast or your nose or whatever. It's about the entire body, the process that one has to go through mentally, physically, emotionally. What brings people to plastic surgeons? How do we avoid people from coming to plastic surgeons? Obviously, this is not the case, but if, if people were able to get to where they needed to go without having to come to me, that would be amazing. The reality is that you know, childbirth and being born with a large nose and your ears being prominent. That's not, there's no control over that, but there are some things that you have control over. And a huge one of that is what you consume. And as a result of what you consume, how that affects the way you look. And as a result of the way you look, how that makes you feel. So it's a, it's great to have you here because, um, and I think you'll elaborate a little bit, but you know, the way people interact with food, people come to me all the time. Right. And so why I think it's important to have someone like you here is they come to me let's say they're a mom, hypothetically, doesn't have to be a mom, and they'd like to have a tummy tuck. And often I'll see them and I'll say, listen, at your current weight, you'll have a good result. But if you want a great result, I really suggest you try to lose a little weight, get in better shape, maybe 10, 15 pounds, 20 pounds. And there's often this, this like, what? As if I just asked them to grow six feet taller you know, this 15, 20 pounds, obviously I think losing weight, and I know you are a big proponent of not weight loss, but your relationship with weight, but just for the lay person, obviously losing weight goes into two categories. There's like the, the, like the short range and the long range. And the long range is, wow, I'm 150 pounds overweight. So we'll leave that aside for a second. But in the short range, I think it afflicts 75% of people where they're 10, 15, 20 pounds overweight, and they just can't seem to get dial that in. And so I'd love for you um, to give us and uh, some ideas of sort of what that relationship is like and why people should perhaps consider if they have a coach for athlete, ath athletics, if they have a financial advisor, why they should consider having someone help them with their relationship vis-a-vis -a, -vis a registered uh, dietitian. So great having you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so just to respond to your first statement, People don't take into consideration that when they are born, their body is predetermined to be the size that it is. So our, we have control of our diet, we have control of our activity, but we can't change our genes. So the more that an individual diets, they weight cycle, they exclude specific foods and food groups, that does more harm than good in where their metabolism is at. So as I say to people that are striving to lose weight and that diet, dieting is like getting a haircut. We go get a haircut. We schedule our appointment a month later. How come? Because our hair is growing back. Well, that's what happens with dieting, whether it be five pounds, 10 pounds, or 50 pounds. The more that an individual has had a history of dieting, they'll say, well, everything I used to do had worked for me in the past, but it's no longer working because not only are they slowing their metabolism down, but that weight comes back and then some. So with whatever it is that a person's eating, and as I say to all my clients, all of our bodies require some carbohydrates, some protein, and some fat. But the piece that I would say 99% of the population is missing is how to pay attention to their body's hunger and fullness signals and be able to look at what their emotional status is before eating. So if a person were to say, you know what, I'm craving today a cheeseburger, and other days I'm craving 
a salad with turkey, we can overconsume either of those meals. Sure. It's- yeah. My wife always says, you know, it, and because I try to, it's, it's what you eat, it's how much of it you eat and when you eat it. So you just assume, well, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I, I, there's no way I could be gaining weight. I'll just eat broccoli. You can eat three pounds of broccoli. Broccoli has calories. You could, you know what I'm trying to say? So, Everything has calories. So, so okay. what, you're, what, you're, what you're saying is it it's, it's also has a lot to do uh, with, with your sati- satiation and right, feeling. Right, our satiety levels. Right. So if, you're, if, you're, if you are eating when you are not hungry, your body will change in a direction that you are dissatisfied with. Whether you're eating carrots and hummus or you're eating Halloween candy. If you are not aware of what your hunger level is, then that's a problem right there. I very much appreciate that you said the component, how you're feeling when you eat. I think that for, for women, um, emotional eating is a, a huge thing where they completely just, the train goes right over the sensor of I'm not hungry. But actually, Monique, so when you say for women, so I don't know if you knew this, the most common eating disorder that's the most overlooked is binge eating disorder. Uh-huh. 60% of women struggle with it and 40% of men. So it's a lot. So a person could be sad, they could be happy, they could be stressed, they could be anxious. They were raised food is a reward. It's you know, I don't know when I'll have an opportunity again. Like the research shows food scarcity. When you grow up in a impoverished environment, a high percentage of the time individuals struggle with binge eating disorder because they never know when they will eat again. It's that feast or famine way of operating. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a lot of a lot of your eating is your pattern and how you again it's it's what you eat, how much of you eat, and how you eat. So, you know, I don't know. I always tell patients, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a registered dietitian. I'm not a nutritionist, but I'm a physician. I'm intelligent, and I've been able to maintain my own weight. So for the most part, what I try to tell pay- people is because, you know, what I hear, again, I have to draw it back to my own practice. You know, I'm, you know the, what I hear over and over and over and over again is like, you don't understand my metabolism. I, I, tr- I barely eat anything. And it's this constant reiteration of the same story, which is I barely eat. I don't, I, I, I exercise. So one miss, one myth that I keep trying to debunk is that if you exercise, you're going to lose weight. That, that's not, that's like not true. First of all, if you exercise, you get hungrier. And if you're not aware of what you're eating, you're just eating more of whatever you're eating because you're hungrier. The exercise is removing the calories, but you have your eating habits, whatever they are, have to be right so that when you exercise, the exercise is helping you in terms of calorie consumption. So yeah, go ahead. If if a person is quote unquote exercising, or I like to say implementing intuitive movement or joyful movement into their life with the hopes it'll change their body, that's the wrong reason to exercise. The research shows endorphins are released, you're more flexible, mood changes, sleep is better, one's happier to be around, their HDL, their good cholesterol increases. But the problem is that People have this these very unrealistic expectations they've picked up through the world of diet culture that we're all living in. We we are in this small radius right here in Beverly Hills, California, and then even leaving this city, it's it's around everywhere. People think, well, if they eat a certain way and they move a certain way, their body will be a certain way, which is false. So there's people that genetically live in larger bodies, like there's people that live in smaller bodies. And I have to say, with a lot of like the patients you're referring to, I've Clients that will say, I have a woman I'm seeing now just that I saw the other and said, you know, what, Robin, I don't eat much. And she's on like her sixth, you know, coffee that day. And I said, well, I'd love to explain what the role of caffeine is on metabolism, because if you want what to. What is your- the role of <laughs> caffeine on metabolism? Glad, now you've I'm rung my just, bell. I'm just glad asked my you've wife. asked, Monique. So the role of caffeine. So ca- caffeine temporarily increases your metabolism and gives you energy. And then it brings it down slower, repeatedly over and over. So if a person wants their latte or their Diet Coke or iced tea, I always like to ask if they could have some food with it because caffeine takes away our ability to recognize what hunger level we actually are. Everyone I know that drinks caffeine will say, I'm not hungry. I'm fine in the afternoon with my Starbucks until dinner. Well, I can guarantee you, and I and I don't bet, I only bet when I'm right, that once that caffeine wears off, an individual will be hungrier. So they'll go into that meal willing to eat whatever, but more likely reach a higher level of fullness because they've not been able to dial in 
to slowing down to feeling when they're content, since it takes 20 to 40 minutes for the message from our brain to kick into our stomach and let us know when we are fulfilled. The, an interesting thing. My, it just blew my mind because so, I love coffee so, so much. So what she's saying is don't use coffee as a crutch, right? Food with it, something to chew. So, so one of the things that we like to do is break it down into this simple fibers. For me personally, everybody has, not everybody, but a lot of people struggle with, as you get older, I'm turning 46, and if everything being the same, I'm not the same. So like if I ate everything the same, I exercise the same, none of which I do, of course, I, would, I <laughs> wouldn't be the same weight because I'm met metabolically a different human being. Where I struggle the most is in satiate, being satiated. That's my struggle. It's that I'll eat and I will always overeat by about 20% because by the time I, because I eat very quickly. So for example, mm. my issue has always been, I eat very quickly, whether that was just because of the way I was in training and food time was scarce and I had to eat quickly. Whatever the case is, even when I have ample time, I'm at dinner and I have all the time in the world, I'll be done, my wife's still like in her, still chewing her first meal, you know, her first bite. And so I eat quickly and then I don't feel full because if I would have waited that 20 minutes, so I, that's why I try to, during the day, I try to get up when I eat and eat my meal scattered a little longer. So I don't sit down for lunch at the office because if I do, I'll be asleep because I overeat and then I go into postprandial coma and then I'm unhappy and then I have to drink a coffee, which, so it's this perpetual cycle. So I eat my lunch over an hour and a half and I eat a little bit, and I let it settle. And then I, eat, and then I invariably only need half of the food that I needed because I'm full, I'm just regularly full. So let's talk about those items that we can give to people as tools. Well, one of the things I just want to say is what you've really done, and this could be something that you know people do, is you've really tried to make it your business to understand your body and yourself, to develop a relationship with yourself. Stomach, meet Dr. Roddy Raban. Head, meet, meet your stomach versus just being an autopilot. So within this is we age, all of our metabolism slow down four to 7% since most people don't keep up the same activity level or vary their duration or intensity within their movement. So what you're doing is what I always say to clients is treating their body as a furnace. To keep that furnace constantly burning, we have to stoke it and keep throwing a log in it. And that's how you're distributing your lunch over the course of multiple hours. So then when your food actually has kicked in to allow you to know where you're feeling, you, you're able to recognize if you're satisfied, if you're eating because it tastes good or because it's there. And I think it's important for people to try to, A, not multitask when they eat. That's very important. When I say multitask, I'm referring to checking email, reading, watching TV, doing something versus just sitting with the food and giving it the attention that it deserves. Is that because you will tend to overeat because you're distracted to the message you're feeling? Is it, what, what aspect specifically? Well, is? if you were reading and eating and you were focusing on the food, chances are one would be rereading the same paragraph over and over again. So that is correct. It's allowing yourself to try to not have any distraction and really recognize, well, how's this tasting? What are different flavors? How's this feeling in my body? Am I enjoying it as much as I have in the past? Because our Preferences change just like a restaurant has an off day and making something. So being able to recognize, am I enjoying it as much as I have in the past versus just being in comatose autopilot mode and eating it just because it's there. It's funny how much we've moved away from, you know, just think about it. The Neanderthal, you would never have these conversations, right? Because these were the primordial necessities of life. Sleep. So sleep, if you go to a sleep specialist, they'll tell you, don't bring in your device into your bed. Because what, what's happened to us is as we've, we've become more you know, advanced, we have derailed the primordial nerve urges. So sex therapists will tell you the same thing. Sleep therapists will tell you the same thing. Food experts will tell you the same thing. Sex, sleep, and food are the more basic things of life that you don't need any explaining. They're just necessary. Yet we've, we've, we've thrown off the balance because of all the other crap that we do. Anxiety, worrying, TV, um, smartphones, et cetera. So one thing that I think people can pay attention to is slow down your eating and in the, and slowing down in it is the eat it, chew it. And as you were saying, try not to be distracted. Because for me personally, it's knowing when you're full. I think a lot of people overeat because we're also accustomed to 
ridiculous portions. I mean, I used to go when I was 17 and I could eat eight meals. Literally, I'd go to Cheesecake Factory. Well, people want to get their money's worth at a restaurant. Right. Or the I could refer to it as the buffet effect. Like, I... I you, you tell me a person who doesn't overeat at a buffet. I mean, it's like it's, it's like a death trap because you paid for it, and then you have to eat your money's worth, and then some, so that you feel like you got the best of that. Or a holiday meal <laughs> where some of these dishes are once a year, and you're so excited to have pumpkin coming out of your ears of, in any form. That's that's my thing. It's like, oh wow, I don't know when I'm gonna have pumpkin muffins and pumpkin bread and pumpkin milk and and pumpkin. It's like. I do like the pumpkin. Yeah. I do, so yeah. so she dressed in pumpkin attire today. <laughs> Adorable. Very full. But I, I, interestingly enough, do you think part of it too is because food is so readily and easily available now? It's all about ease of food. You have food delivery. You have all of these companies. You have the, the deli counters now. People don't even, they consider it they're eating at home, but technically they're just buying pre-packaged things in a grocery store. They're really not eating at home. Dining out or takeout or Postmates or any of these delivery services, I think, yes, they make food available. But I think, again, it's people not being connected to their stomach. It's like I'll say your head is in Tahiti and your body's in Mexico. And learning <laughs> how to merge the two is really an important concept. Tahiti was great, by the way. I just got back from Bora Bora. <laughs> I had my honeymoon there. That was great. That was my honeymoon a year and a half too late. Cool. But, <laughs> but yes, yes, back to, you want to have that connection. And I, and I think what you said about a readily available is one thing. I think the size portions are ridiculous because what happens is for a lot of people, you do what's, what's given to you. So if I give you this plate, a clean plate club, right. And well, it was your raise, right. You know, if you have a plate, this is the food. I for sure hate to waste food. And so if I'm at cheesecake factory, I'm always going to eat more than if I'm at a place that has half the portion and who decided the portion? The guy behind the counter. There was no, they didn't weigh it and say, this is a normal portion for 170 pound gentleman with this metabolism. They said, plop. So you tend to gravitate to places that have more or less food. Oh, are, are you, have you been to Claim Jumper? Whoever's making those choices, like this is for a 400 pound ditch digger. <laughs> like those are the, they're like this big. So, okay, listen, but what I like to do is when we come back, I'd yes. like to talk about some of the more extreme situations. I think there's a lot of people, there's segment A, which is, us average people who are struggling with some basic dietary skills that we talked about. And then I think there's a subset of people that are really struggling that have binging disorders, have anorexia, have body dysmorphia syndrome. You know, people assume that the majority of my patients, oh, how much body dysmorphic patients do you get? The truth, I get almost none in my practice, overt body dysmorphic. I think, you know, we're not going to get into the areas of gray, like everyone has a little of it. No, no, I'm talking about like major, Obvious. like major, major. But there are people out there who have these um, illnesses, if I can say, um, that needs some serious coaching, whether that's from their parents, their loved ones, or whatever. So let's let's definitely talk about that when or we get from the break. A registered dietitian, absolutely. Well, she's out there trying yes. to get, she's trying to do what I'm doing, which is trying to enlist other people to to amplify. Because what you realize at some point is you can only do so much one at a time. That's the reason why that's I have we're a podcast. A part of teams. Yeah. So. All right, let's do it on the way back. Thank you for listening to this uh, portion of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. We'll be back shortly with the second half. And we are back with the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. This particular episode is about what you can actually change via your mouth with a uh, registered dietitian, Robin Goldberg, and board-certified plastic surgeon, Dr. Roddy Raban. I think, it's I think the way you go about it, and I, this is why I'm a big fan of seeing professionals, you know, today, everyone is a cosmetic expert, much like everybody, as you had said, is a nutritionist. What the hell does that mean? It means that I just, oh, I'm aware of nutrition. And because I'm, I know the word paleo and the word that I know, that's not, that doesn't make you an expert like you do. And I think you, you said a lot of things that were really interesting because it's not so much that the information isn't out there. It's how you spin it and how you say it. And if that, the way you say it brings clarity to the person, I think that's the expertise. And I think we touched a lot about those things, but let's segue now a little bit to people who are struggling a little bit more because well, I said to you before, I don't have a ton of those people in my practice. I think I've had maybe, uh, I tend to get very close to the patients. I've had one or two bulimic patients and I've had probably two or three anorexic patients in my entire career. So not a ton, but I think those people are really out there. So why don't you help us categorize these different conditions a little bit and sort of what uh, maybe your thoughts are in terms of 
support change. family members and change and how we can go about doing that? So there's many types of eating disorders that exist and I, I encompass them all in my practice. I see individuals with anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, chewing and spitting, laxative and diuretic abuse and compulsive exercise. I see, I would say 40% males in my practice and 60% female. And oftentimes fear is what brings the individual in. They've been diagnosed with a health condition as well. They've had a heart attack. They were diagnosed with diabetes. They have breast cancer. They have testicular cancer. And, and oftentimes because they've been stigmatized and shamed at their physician's office, their physician does not know what they've struggled with. So okay. like, as I even just think of a woman I was referred to, that was referred to me um, for gestational diabetes, her gynecologist had no idea that she's been, she struggles with bulimia nervosa and she's been purging throughout the entire pregnancy. Right. So, so I mean, that's a big, that's a big issue because I think that people are obviously part of helping people is having people tell you and feeling vulnerable to tell you that they have the problem. You know, we have some fat, we know some, close people to me that have binging, one has binging, one has bulimia, and nobody know nobody would have known that, right? And this, because they're very, a lot of people are, are well adapted, you know, they're, they're well, undercover. The, the individuals, yeah, live a secret life. They live a double life. And until something radical happens, they have passed out, they're purging blood, they've had a heart attack, then it's, it's been, you know, out in the public, but oftentimes, you know, individuals don't feel safe. And I make it my business that seeing me in my office is a safe space. And what happens with me will stay here and they will put on the consent who I can collaborate with. And that's very important because I know I am not a psychologist or a therapist. I'm a certified eating disorder registered dietitian through what's called IADEP, which is the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. So I like to connect clients with a therapist or psychologist or some mental health care provider if they don't have one because that will enhance my work with them. Yeah, I mean, which goes down to the saying that you, you need you need a team, a team approach, a right? Team. Nobody nobody wins an Olympic gold medal with just a coach. They have a they have a physical therapist, they have a a person who helps them with their shooting, one of them helps them with their dribbling. You know, everybody it, that's how you become excellent and that's how you become out of unexcellence, which is if you're struggling whatever polar end of it is. So, let's talk about maybe some of the more common ones. Which is the most common eating disorder that exists? Is it is it binging? Binge eating disorder is the most common. So why don't you disorder. describe that? Because maybe some people don't even realize they have binge eating. So binge eating disorder is the individuals eating a concentrated amount of food in a short period of time. They're eating it fast. They're not sitting at a table and taking their time. There's so much shame and embarrassment behind this that oftentimes individuals are you know, eating out of garbage. I mean, it can be not the classic example. People always think of like, oh, it's the person with the grocery cart that's loaded up. I mean, that, but I would say more times than none, the individual I see will order a lot of takeout food and they are binging on all the takeout that has arrived at their home. Now, people who have binge eating disorder, do they tend to, um, do they, they, do they tend to digest it? Do they tend to vomit it? Do they end up, do they end up gaining weight? How does, how does, so if you how are, can you spot them? How do you, how do you find, in other words, if you're, you're, you're like, God, maybe my children has a bit binging. How do you identify them unless you catch them binging? How do you find out? So first of all, individuals who struggle with binging disorder do not engage in some sort of method to relieve their food. So they are not compulsively exercising. They are not using laxatives or diuretics. They are not inducing vomiting. vomiting. Right. Yeah. So they are keeping the food down. Um, you know, some of the screening questions that I ask people is, are, are you an emotional eater? You know, what are reasons that lead you to eat when you're not hungry? Were you bullied as a kid or as an adult or fat shamed? You know, we talk about what their history has been like leading to where they're at now on an emotional level and physical level. And also when, you know, people say, I mean, I was listening to a man the other day. He says, you know, what, Robin, I don't have friends. Food is my friend. Food is my lover. It's always there for me. Do they tend me. to be overweight since they're not? That's a myth. Or do they compensate in, in, they take the same number of calories, but do it differently? No, I mean, they're, they, they're not human calculators. I would say more, more people that struggle with binge eating disorder are not counting. It's just, there are people that genetically live in smaller bodies like I do. And there's people that genetically live in larger bodies. 
So walking around and telling people you're fat and things like that, the connotation of it is terrible for self-esteem. And as we now know, because we're a modern civilization, that can plunge them further into their own sense of depression and self-worth. Conversely, if we reach a place where we are tolerant of everything as a, as a, as a group, you know, we, we struggle with this with everything now. Everything now is about sensitivity and not labeling it and not, uh, my child will be whatever my child wants to be and I'll let them grow up at any gender they want. And there's a whole lot of debate about that now. I mean, you know, we have a responsibility to those people that if you're, so let's I'll give you an example. If the person is 5'3 and they weigh 160 pounds, you might say they live in a larger frame. But if a person's 5'3 and they weigh 300 pounds, when do you, as the person who's struggling with the balance, because you have this psychological component, say, now you're what? Overweight? Are you obese? Because we have to call it at what it is so that we can then not shame them, but help them. Because at 300 pounds, 5'3, you're not going to live a very long life. So where, how do you struggle? Where do you, what do you call that person five, three at 300 pounds? Well, there are people I see that I will use the term that live in larger bodies that are healthy at any size. So I'm what's called a haze provider. And that means health at any size, health at every size. So there are people that I know that I wish my lipid panel was as great as theirs. Wow. And they're larger than I am. And knowing I hereditarily have had high cholesterol since I was 13. So within this, there are people that have been larger since the day they were born. And sure. looking at their genetics, their family members, right. the culturally. Samoan, Samoan. Absolutely. So within that, if a person does not have any medical issues, I mean, there is data that supports like if you look at dr linda bacon's book health at every size and then her second book um, body respect with lucy Aframore, all the studies are in there that show an individual could be quote unquote perfectly healthy in a larger body so i understand from like a surgical procedure and when people are coming to you if they are not eating because they're hungry they're eating because they're sad or because it's there i think with a lot of you know these people that if they might say you know what I'm eating what I like, I'm stopping when I'm satisfied, then there isn't an issue. But that isn't always the case. Right, no, and I'm not talking about those instances. And I mean, I understand that there's a lot of gray area, but this is the area where we as professionals kind of have to dig our feet in. You know, obviously, if the person is 300 pounds, 5'3", and their cholesterol is perfect, they have no osteoarthritis in their hips or joints, then, you know, kudos to you. And he's doing a triathlon, he's running past me, great. But we both know that that's not the case. We both know that a 5'3 person is not going to be okay with his hips and his joints. You do know he's going to have hypertension. So the instances that refer to individuals who have a great lipid panel are far fewer than the individuals that are not. And so in an effort to be all-encompassing, we may run the risk of not coming to the rescue of people because we're so worried about not pushing them over. So we had this conversation because I take care of a lot of people who were three, four, five hundred pounds who were in the near brink, and it required someone to not fat shame them or whatnot, but like to pull them back. And we talked about it with a, one of my patients. One of the best episodes we had was a woman who had a uh, bypass. She was, I listened to it the other and, day, and she yeah. was, and mm. yeah, and, and she actually went because her husband wasn't sleeping because she had sleep apnea and he was so worried. He loved her, and like it wasn't anything negative. He just basically said, I'm afraid you're going to suffocate and die. So I don't sleep at night. So and that's, yeah, that and was, I, and I just, that's the only thing. And I, and I recognize, and I think that your approach is awesome because it's, it's definitely it's more necessary. encompassing than pushing out. I just want to, you know, you know, you know, we got to, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm concerned that we're become, and I, they're saying you're we're becoming soft. I don't think we're becoming soft or becoming uh, more aware and encompassing of people, but I do think there are some border lines where we, I think we do need to draw a line and try to help people back in. I, I think so. I, I work from what's called a weight inclusive approach. I see all body shape, sizes, and genders. And, you know, I was sitting with someone the other day who is in the digit range that you had referred. And, you know, we were discussing, does she eat because she's sad? Like, basically, she did not acknowledge anything. I said, you know, she's like, Robin, I've, I've been, you know, a big kid since I was really young and I walk, but I'm finding that, you know, she's on all kinds of meds for depression and, and really, and I was like, yeah, some medications could, could exacerbate, but really it's not every day I could sit with someone that was like, 
yeah, you know what? I'm eating what I like. I'm, I don't think I, you know, eat until I'm stuffed. I think the bigger issue is that she has unbalanced sporadic eating times, and then that sets her up to have a larger meal. So there are people see that, and I look at her whole family and yeah, they're built similarly. And there, and there's people, it's like, if you look at, I'm going to have, I'm going to have to dive in here. (laughs) Have you ever been overweight? When I was a kid, I lived in a larger body. How much larger? I mean, I, I was not, you know, what you're referring to, but yes, genetically. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to, I'm Hispanic mm-hmm. and my, I'm, uh, I went to hypnotherapy mm-hmm. and lost 40 pounds. My dad died of congestive heart failure. My grandmother died of congestive heart failure. My mother's fat. Her sister's fat. My two brothers are fat. And I absolutely refused to believe or allow that that was just my course in life. I was going to do whatever it took to get to a place where I could look in the mirror and say, I am comfortable, happy, proud, healthy. Um, and I am in c- control of my destiny because in a way your, your body anatomy is destiny. Freud said it. And I think just saying, yeah, you came from fat people. So what? I, I came from people that didn't graduate college too. And I came from people... I mean, at some point, people have to, ign- maybe to themselves, this woman's depressed because she's fat. You know, like, I mean, I, I mean. No, no there's, there's psychological issues. But I think, though, too, when a person is in charge, you know, if, if you are going through a natural extreme measures to change what you're eating and you're constantly thinking about, I can't eat this and I'm sad and I'm hungry then it's probably not the place that your body's naturally meant to be at. And maybe for you, Veronica, you're like, okay, you know what, Robin? I eat what I like. I have made some but, changes. But what if I eat what I like is Oreos? Like when I was a little kid, I only wanted to eat Oreos. That so wouldn't what, be what cool. what I would say, when, <laughs> so I have adults that have, you know, the mindset of, of, a, of a child. And we'll talk about there's a time in your life that your adult self needs to have a conversation with your your childhood self because if you're just living on oreos then you might find you know what i'm I'm tired i don't have energy and eventually other cravings occur because you're lacking other vitamins and minerals but it, it comes to a place where your adult self and your you know childhood self need to you know merge in the middle and say okay what's going to work for me because now i'm in midlife fair enough fair enough i i it's and i and i I know these are treacherous waters. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, it's a, all these topics are, in, are they, wouldn't be, they wouldn't be interesting. They wouldn't require experts. They wouldn't require dialogue if they were straightforward. There, there's I think a re- it's necessary not to shame people. I no, there's 100% no question about agree. That. Just, I love that approach. It, of the- I think, listen, we all, we all, in everything we do, we all draw a line in the sand. And the question always is, where is the line that you draw? And in some instances, somebody draws a, the line a little bit to the left and to the right. Correct. The most important thing is not where you draw the line in the sand, but that you're having a conversation about that line. Well, I and like so, her approach yeah, of you. Well, At some point, you got to be a grown up and put on your big girl panties think, and I, say, I'm tired right now. Right? I, I feel think, good. I do think in general, a more inclusive approach will help you help other people than a more exclusive of approach. Of course. So I didn't know, like kudos, being called names when I was a kid. Does. I was nobody, a very chunky child. Nobody does. So kudos to you and your your approach. I think it's obviously a, a very... Um, it's, it seems like a very loving way to go about the process. And hey, we're, we're happy that you came here and gave us a little bit of insight and, and taught us a little bit more about, uh, as you had said once before, it's about the relationship with food, not so much the food itself. So, And it's, it's not about being afraid of food. I mean, food has so many wonderful benefits and not being afraid and treating it as the enemy. Yeah. So That's Monique, a very good takeaway. No, uh, no, I'm, is not the I'm enemy. very healthy now. <laughs> I'm just messing no. with you. Thanks. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you for coming. I appreciate being here. We'll have to have a part two at some point. Yes, part, I would like that very much. Part so. two. Thank you for listening to this episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. Please, Robin Goldberg, could you please let our listeners know where to find you? I can be found at www.askaboutfood.com. My Instagram handle is Robin with a Y, Robin Goldberg RDN. And my Twitter is Robin with a Y, GRD. And my new website, which has a splash page for my book that will be coming out early 2020, is is the eating disorder trap.com. Very I don't cool. even have a Twitter shit. Now I gotta go get it. She's Twitter. got everything. <laughs> You've got this is very good stuff. Thank you again for listening to Plastic for Surgery Uncensored.